My name, my name is Mariam Ghani, and I am um, the Stakeholder Engagement and Communications Manager at Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center. And I'm so excited to welcome you all to our first regional peat symposium of the year. Um, so if you're new to our series, uh, we've run this last year as well. We have a five part series of our symposium that runs from about April to August. And so if you join us from last year, welcome back. And if this is your first time, welcome. We're so happy that you are joining us today. So as I mentioned, my name is Maria and I work for Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center. And we are part of the larger coalition called People for Peat. Um, and this is made up of three different organizations, World Resources Institute, uh, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, as well as Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center. So our program is called SUPA, which is an EU funded program uh, to mitigate haze in the ASEAN region. And we have such an exciting lineup of speakers today uh, with really interesting backgrounds and I'm really excited to share them with you. But first, a few housekeeping items. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> So first of all, if you could please rename yourself in Zoom in the following format, so your name followed by your organization, um, and throughout the, throughout the presentations, if you could keep yourself uh, muted and your video switched off, uh, that would be great. And throughout the presentations, of course, feel, feel free to use the chat box if you have any questions for myself, for our team, for all of our presenters, uh, because at the end of the symposium, we'll be doing a Q&A with all of our speakers. And I'm also excited to share with you today that we are conducting today's presentation in two languages. So there are two languages available, uh, the first one being English and the second one being Bahasa Malaysia. So if you would like to select any of these channels, click the interpretation button, uh, make sure that's available to you at the bottom there. And it would be best if you click the language that you either speak in or listen in. So that would be ideal. Uh, I would suggest you to do that so that um, it will be as smooth as possible and you can hear our speakers in English and in Malay, depending on which your language preference is. Okay, so first, before we start, I want to do a quick poll uh, just to find out where everyone's coming from. How did you learn about today's symposium? So let me launch that real quick. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a couple seconds to fill in the poll about where you're joining us from and how you heard about today's event. Because it's, it's really great to have so many people from so many different parts of the world join us and join our speakers to learn more about peatlands and why it's important to conserve them. All right, so we've got about 60%, 8%, give you a couple more seconds. All right. We end the poll and share the results. So it looks like a lot of you have come to us from our emails and our newsletter, which is great. I'm so glad you subscribed. That's great. Thank you for your support and thank you for subscribing to our newsletters. And then a lot of you have come from social media as well, which is really cool. Uh, so that means our social media marketing team is working. Good job, team. Uh, so yeah, no matter where you've come from, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. All right, so now on to the next thing, which is to introduce what our agenda is for today. So uh, right now we're just doing a quick introduction and I'll slowly introduce our host as well. And then we will have all these really exciting presentations from uh, Mr. Mr. Ilham, who's also known as Abang Ikan uh, or Brother Fish uh, in Malay. And then we will have both Dr. Al as well as Dr. Ronald Verneman uh, present on the importance of coastal peatland subsidence in the face of uh, in the face of climate change and sea level rise, and then we'll follow that with a panel discussion and Q and A's while we close. So yeah, um, I'm very excited for you guys to join us for this. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my uh, wonderful colleague from the World Resources Institute, Tommy, uh, to give us an introduction about people for peat. Over to you, Tommy. Uh, thank you, Maria. On behalf of People for Pit Coalition, I'm delighted to welcome everyone this afternoon to our first series of Regional Pit Symposium of the year 2022. 
like uh, Marian mentioned, this is our second year of the PFP Regional Pitland Symposium Series within the framework of the sustainable use of pitland and haze mitigation in ASEAN, or as we call it, the SUPA program. The SUPA is an ASEAN-wide initiative supported by the European Union to sustain ASEAN's efforts in combating transboundary haze pollution and pitland fires in the region. I wish to extend our gratitude to the distinct speakers that will share important insights on the topic of pit water management. And finally, thank you and warm welcome as well uh, to our pitland project partners across the region who are joining us today. Now to set our high spirit this afternoon, let us start with a video from PFP. with the real action in the ground together with the local peoples and supported by government and the corporation and it will be one of the best ways. <laughs> My hope for the Asian peatlands is that there will be more awareness amongst the general public, amongst the government, amongst the private parties about the very important role peatlands play in regulating the climate, in maintaining biodiversity, and in providing an income for local and regional communities. But to maintain peatland ecosystem, it is essential to build capacity of local communities, especially in restoration and wise use of peace forests. In the future, we hope to see more businesses on peatlands operate sustainably. Let's help protect our peat forest together because we need to set a better future for our children. Have you enjoyed the, the quick video from PFP? So we are doing the EU Sporty Super Program, which consists of uh, two components. Component one is the uh, one that is now being implemented by GIZ, working with the state actors in the ASEAN region, while the People for Pit is working on a component two of the SUPA that is uh, focusing more in working with the non-state actors. And the coalitions of people for pit consists of is made up of uh, three organizations. Uh, we are the World Resources Institute in Indonesia, Indonesia, based in Jakarta, Indonesia. We have next uh, IDH or the Sustainable Trade Initiative or the Yayasan Initiative Dagang Hijau in, in Bahasa Indonesia, also based in Jakarta, Indonesia. As but not least, we have a Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center or TRCRC based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, SUPA component two focuses on the three main challenges in the sustainable management of peatland in Southeast Asia. One is the lack of reliable data and information on the state of uh, peatland in the, in the region. And the next one is the limited options for sustainable business solutions within the landscape areas. In relation with that, also the limited access to funding in pitland areas. And the, the final challenge is the lack of awareness and capacity in dealing with the pitland. This is the third year of the SUPA. And we had done quite a lot of activities with the wide range of stakeholders. So on the pillar that, uh, pillar one on the data information, focusing on resolving the challenges around the uh, limited knowledge on the pitland, we conducted a series of meeting, organizing a, suffer, uh, con a series of conference of parties and public webinars. And we also uh, collecting the uh, data on the, on the pitland in areas. Based on the data that we collected, we provided 
research grant to the 11 selected individual researchers in the area. So we have now uh, 11 researchers uh, working on the on the peatland research under the super grant in Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, PDR, and the Philippines. On the pillar two, on the business investment, we also conducted a series of meetings with uh, non-set actors on the sustainable business uh, collaborations, which uh, resulted in a series of workshops on innovative business and financing. With that, uh, we also run our business hub or the business accelerator programs that provided a technical assistance to the selected uh, business uh, and initiative uh, by the smallholders in the region. So we had, uh, we had and this is now still ongoing, five cohorts members from the first uh, batch, and now we are finalizing the, the second batch for the cohorts. On the outreach and advocacy under Pillar 3, we are doing a series of public awareness activities, including this pitch uh, symposium series. So last year, we managed to uh, complete our five-part symposium series that accumulatively gathered the participations of more than 700 participants. So yeah, this is just... Uh, a bit of uh, spotlights of uh, what uh, we've been doing. So mostly as uh, as also many other projects within this uh, two years of COVID situations, most of our activities were done through a virtual challenge. And uh, we are glad that uh, we managed to still uh, engage with a wide uh, range of stakeholders on the pit line in the area. So pass it back to MG for the next poll. Over to you, MG. Thank you so much, Tommy. So our next poll is just a bit of demographic information to find out where you are all joining us from. So yeah, do let us know which country you're coming in from. Uh, I know there's no other. If, if you're not part of the ASEAN region, I apologize. Uh, but we will note that for our next future uh, poll. Very cool. So far. I get to see the results live, but I'll share them with you in a moment. I'll give everyone a little bit more time to complete uh, the poll, just to share where they're coming from, um, what country, and hopefully, you know, uh, we can see where everyone's at. All right, I'm going to end the poll here and share our results. So it looks like most of our participants are coming. It's an, almost a toss up between Indonesia and Malaysia. Awesome. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have no one from Cambodia today. We've got one person or yeah, maybe one person from Myanmar. Uh, uh, quite a few people from the Philippines, which is always great. Welcome everyone, uh, as well as Thailand and Vietnam. So welcome to everyone. And I look forward to sharing uh, this experience with you today. Okay. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day. Uh, none other than Muhammad Ilham Nur Hakim Lokman, who is also known locally in Malaysia as Abang Ikan, which means fish brother or fish bro, I don't know <laughs> if you want to call it that. And he is a citizen ichthyologist whose love for fish is contributing to the study and the conservation of the amazing diversity of our freshwater ecosystems. So he comes and joins us from Muar Johor in Malaysia. And he's traveled all over Malaysia as well as Indonesia to locate the country's fishes with the intention of documenting them for the future generation. So a very noble cause. So despite having no paper qualifications, he has since gained recognition by the University Tun Hussein On as an external researcher due to his passion and in-depth knowledge on fish species. He collaborates with local and international freshwater species researchers and is also the co-author of the book Fishes of North Selangor Peat Swamp Forest, uh, which we'll share the link later today. So he joins us today to share his experience on how he's been working tirelessly to conserve tropical peat swamp forests. So uh, Mr. Ilham, over to you. And I will... Hi everyone. Okay. Yeah, I will the uh, my slide. Yes, one moment.
Okay, next. Hello, Assalamualaikum semua dan salam sejahtera. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Muhammad Ilham Hakim. I'm from uh, Johor Moa and uh, today I'm going to share about myself and uh, how how I started and uh, continue from there. And I'm actually like, I, I like the I like the fish as a hobby. Since childhood, I like the fish and uh, all kinds of uh, fish. And uh, next. So from uh, so I'm from a fish keeper from as a hobbit and I have shared in my Facebook all about my discoveries and I always share in Facebook and I made friends from different uh, backgrounds uh, as you can see in the photo all of this are uh, they are doctors they have scientists from different backgrounds and all of them they are expert if, uh, in ecologists. And uh, because I know them and uh, my connection at large, and uh, I get to know scientists from all over the world, from England and everywhere, and to, and uh, including Malaysia, uh, whether it's from uh, fishery or geology or pathology or friends from uh, who are interested in all kinds of fields. So uh, until now, from my, I have collected around 292 freshwater species across Malaysia and and a few more species are from Malaysia. All discovery, uh, I'm going to uh, catch them and then I will keep them in a museum in the university for, for research and also to help the students to do all the research in Malaysia. And today I'm going to share with you about this, um, this national park in Johor, which is the last big swan forest in Johor, Malaysia. And this uh, this forest, this is the largest and the remaining big swan forest in Johor and has an area of 3,700 3, hectares. And it is gazetted as a state park under the uh, jurisdiction of the Johor government. And this forest has, has a very high biodiversity and this forest it is, this is a swamp forest and it is, it is protected and it is the only forest that is being protected under the uh, gov uh, government of Johor. So in the year 2019, I have joined the uh, one expedition uh, that is organized by the uh, Johor Forestry, whereby many of the scientists and experts from all over the Malaysia, from different fields, they joined this expedition for four days. And I joined the group that is uh, focused in uh, on a fish, uh, each geology, and that, that is uh, regarding the amphibian. So our result from the research of these few days, we get to know that this place has this uh, beta persephone, uh, which is a uh, hyper endemic in Johor. And uh, it is only available in Ahu. And uh, the quantity are not many. And uh, it is quite uh, endangered. And a part of that, we also found this uh, beta cochina, and uh, it is only be found in Malaysia in this uh, jungle and there's no can't find in other places if yes you can only found it in uh, jambi indonesia and uh, this is vulnerable and almost extinct and uh, it's very unique because it is in malaysia it's only available in uh, the forest of ayah hitam next and a kotolita kate and this is also unique it is very small fish just like a sardine or just like a just one cm the size is only one cm so if you in malaysia you can see this in sarawak but in this uh, west malaysia we can find it in this uh, forest and you can find it in other places and this species is very difficult to be found because all this while this uh, in this research 
for five years, I can only find uh, seven specimens. Uh, mungkin we can, uh, maybe we are able to find more, but uh, we still need to explore. But we hope that this fish will be protected uh, soon. And this is Echo uh, Locarius cutisoma, and uh, it's a type of fish. Uh, uh, this is very unique, and uh, whereby the fin is only in the middle of the body. And uh, this one is only found in West Malaysia in Selangor, uh, in this uh, forest, protected forest. And uh, for your knowledge, uh, there's one uh, species that is, uh, they call this um, Echlocleodius, uh, this is found in Pekang Pahang. And this species is, has not been found for the late 20 years because it has been extinct. So the chances of the fish of this Curtisoma may be fine, may be fading, facing the same fate. If it is not protected, it will be lost as well. Just like it happened to the earlier species. So uh, the result of our research that we gathered to more than 30 species of the uh, freshwater fish in this forest, whereby a few, uh, a few species are under endemic. And we also found a few species of uh, frog species that are unique, that is including uh, Kukrawana. And uh, this is a type of species whereby this is the first record in Malaysia that uh, we found in this forest. Before that, we didn't know that it's available in Malaysia. And from this result of research, we got to know that this is available in this forest and it is maybe have the chance to become uh, extinct if you didn't protect it. And there's this uh, Nephantis species and uh, many uh, there, are, there are many species in this, there are about seven to eight types and uh, lately this forest, forestry and uh, they found a new species and a newly hybrid species that can, that's possible to be published uh, in a soon, sooner time. So in this uh, forest Ahu, we have already done the research of about 50% uh, 50% of the uh, size of the forest. And uh, we will have to uh, do a lot of uh, another 85% of research in this forest and uh, to know a few, uh, many more types of the species that, uh, that can be found. So let's talk about the uh, fish conservation in uh, forest in Ahu. So before that, I'm going to talk about the uh, destruction of the beta Persephone habitat. That was 20 years ago. We have three habitats. Uh, first is beta Persephone and now, and this forest is getting lesser. So, so as I said, beta Persephone, it can only be found in uh, this world that is in only available in Ahu. And this is the this species can be found in Indonesia, but we cannot declare yet because uh, over there it has not been uh, researched with details. And uh, we can only take note that this is only last known a uh, last known habitat in Malaysia. So this is the type of the local locality of the habitat that where we found this species for first time, which is 1986. So this habitat has been destroyed for in year 2008 and uh, now we cannot do anything because this forest is under the uh, private property. Therefore, we cannot stop them and we cannot do anything because this is, this is a private property. Next. Yes, this is the habitat for this is uh, very famous in the world and whereby the scientists from over, all over the world, from German, uh, they come here to do research on fish. We call it this uh, swam kopi. And this swam kopi, it is also the uh, private property. And uh, the photo has been taken by my friend, Dr. Zaha. And this is a very beautiful habitat. And with this habitat, of this uh, beta Persephone, they stay in this kind of environment and uh, it looks like the water is very lacking, but this is the habitat. And uh, sometimes we may be 
may be not appreciating it, but actually the habitat, uh, the fish that is living in this water, it is very extreme type. Because this uh, certain uh, species, specific, uh, species can only live in this water. So for some fish, they may die in this water, but for this spe uh, species, it's very different. So this is the uh, Kopi Swamp, and this is taken in uh, 2016. Uh, next. And this is in a year of uh, February 2016. We catch the fish over here and there are a lot of uh, species and very interesting and we can say that we need not go into these uh, protected forests because over here is still okay. And it's easier for us to do research and collection and uh, as a hobby as well, because we need not go into the deep of the forest. And uh, in a few months, this uh, forest is gone. We couldn't do anything. We cannot stop anything because this is the uh, private property. So this uh, land in a few months is being destroyed. And this is the uh, this happened when the uh, plantation when they did they built this uh, drainage, and uh, when when you have this. You have this uh, pit land, but there's no water. So therefore, the fish getting lesser and die. So from here, this, uh, this photo that I shown earlier on, and this become the scenario in the 2016. And now it's become a plantation. So this place is really, is really gone, is really destroyed. So this is the uh, one of the species of the fish that we found in this forest. Uh, this is Borarus maculatus. And this is one of the uh, fish species, the smallest fish species in the world. It is one of the smallest fish. And uh, really uh, many fishes has died. And this is including beta Persephone. I found it and I rescued it. I rescued for about 2,000 to 3,000 of them. And uh, most of them died because of, uh, of this uh, forest being deforested and, uh, and then the weather become hot. So this is the scenario after the uh, land has been destroyed 100%. And so we share what happened at this forest in a group chat in the Facebook. That is the uh, Malaysia freshwater fish. And this is one of the popular uh, face page, uh, Facebook page that is for the research on fish. So after we shared, many people share again what happened. And from people people who doesn't know about this forest, they, they thought nothing about this, uh, how, this forest. They thought it's just a jungle as usual. But they didn't know that there are many uh, species of this uh, beta pesophonic, which is endemic. And uh, many people take action from here. And after I shared, uh, many friends came and helped. So we came back to this habitat to rescue as many as we can. So from, I think that I have uh, moved them, uh, moved 3,000 to 4,000 of the fish to other places. And then uh, we can catch all these uh, beta cocina for about uh, 200 to 300. So, uh, ni yang hari-hari terakhir yang dekat tempat yang cantik tadi, uh, memang, okay, dah memang terlampau kering dah, memang tak ada apa-apa dah. Okay, next. Uh, so 25 species, uh, eh, sorry, 25 uh, peratus uh, ikan yang saya tangkap, saya... 25% uh, of the rescued fish were given to um, to friends that are breeding the fish for breeding. And they breed it successfully. Next, we show what we have done in a, doc, in a TV documentary. And it is shared worldwide what we have done, and a lot have followed what we have done. I brought the TV crews to the habitat and we tell them what happened so that everyone understands the importance of this habitat. It is like the earth sponge. If this forest is not available, the forest will be uh, flooding and a lot will happen. So, uh, ni, uh, Recently, I got the chance to work with Dr. Latif so and his students so to do a research on the habitat that is in the forest, forest reserve. 
So we do uh, monitoring, we do research, research on the ecosystem, and so on. We don't just um, focus on uh, beta, although it's endemic. So we do research on almost all, including mammal, primate, uh, fishes. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, so sorry. So we do research on all uh, related to fish, soil, and so on. And the result from what we have done, we have a big, we have done a big project that is after three years, we have breeded more than 500 beta persifoni. And the one that we are releasing is the first time record we are releasing um, um, them in the Ahu forest. And this is a habitat that we have and we will continue to breed and release them for people to understand the importance of the fishes in this uh, forest. I am grateful that as far as I know, before this, there is no one who do such a thing, releasing the fishes. Firstly, because maybe there are people who does it, but officially, this is the first time, because before that, I have uh, done a few releases. Nothing happened because it is not in record. So this is my um, cooperation with the community and a lot of those who are involved and who live um, near this forest. Ahu forest is very unique because it is very acidic and the YSI uh, monitor runs 3.8. This is during rainy uh, weather, but during the dry season, it is um, 3.5 pH. So it is very acidic. So, but certain fishes can live here and the fishes that live here are of course very unique. This is the water in the forest reserve. It is still um, nice. Uh, the color is like uh, the color of tea, but actually it is um, quite clear. And this is the forest that we have done our release. It's very beautiful. It's different from the forest reserve. Um, this tree is important because it will protect the fishes from the hot weather. If the habitat is hot, the fishes cannot survive. So if there is swamp with no trees, it is useless. So everything plays a role. And this is what we have done from the assistance from the community, they have done a gallery and me and my friends uh, built this gallery as best as we can. It is not yet completed. So we put these fishes, uh, fishes in Ahu, we catch and then we breed and put it in the tank so that people can come and see uh, what is available in the forest. And on the wall, we will explain uh, what we have done, uh, messages, and so on. Therefore, I hope when this gallery is completed fully, people will come and they will be more, they will understand better the importance of this forest. So I try to breed the fishes. I try to breed the fishes and I put it back in this gallery without uh, catching the fish in the forest because if we continue to catch, it is not that good. So I try to breed and I try to release it in the forest. We try our best to do this. Therefore, what I have done in the forest cannot be done without the help from this club because this club has helped me a lot and they are a community that live in 
near this forest and they have helped me from the beginning till the end, including with forestry, fishing, and so on. Without this community, all this will not be possible and they are very important and they are uh, very interested in this conservation work. So this conservation project can be said will be successful if we have the cooperation from uh, parties from the forestry and so on. And this project to me has been successful and we, con we will continue it for, uh, as long as we can. Challenges. The challenges are a lot. I will tell you a bit on what is very challenging for this uh, conservation. Firstly, the plantation, they like to do um, uh, a deep, um, like this. Um, over here is the forest and over there they want to do plantation. Uh, and when they do it, the swamp is no longer there. There's no longer water. The only thing is available is the uh, pit. There's no, uh, the swamp is no longer there. And this is what happened in Ahu. And the farmers, they do a drain too deep and it affects the forest hydrology. When the water um, becomes dry, it poses problem. A lot of trees and fishes die. And this is what will happen when it becomes too dry. This is the forest in Ahu last year. The forest caught fire. It's because it is too dry. Dry because of the uh, hydrology that is not um, correct. And when they do um, canal that is uh, deep, um, the water will uh, seep up and the soil will be will be dry. So when it becomes dry, it will caught fire. And this is what happened to these people. And every year they have to put down the fire to call the fire brigade in Ahu and the community come to help. But if everywhere it happened, it will pose a big problem. I don't know when this um, Ahu forest uh, can sustain. I feel anybody have to think how to eradicate this problem. Invasive species, a uh, species that are in my slide, are crayfish from Australia and brought in uh, to Malaysia. But unfortunately, they are thrown inside the drain and they breeded in the peninsula as well as Sabah and Sarawak. And this crayfish uh, likes to breed in acidic uh, water like um, this kid. I have been with uh, CHM group and we have a campaign with the villagers and students there. We have caught hundreds of uh, crayfish. If they go into the forest reserve, I think they have gone there. I guarantee that the fish will be extinct because this crayfish, when it is out of the forest reserve, in the past there was catfish and a lot of species there, it was already extinct. There's only crayfish available there. And these crayfish will destroy every fauna and flora. They eat everything. If can, we try to catch as many of them and try to destroy them. It is difficult, but I think we can do it. There's one thing that I have not mentioned on my failure is that the attitude of people who likes to um, do bad things. Sometimes um, we have protected the forest, but the public, sometimes they will go into the forest and they steal the fish. Maybe they steal the fish, but it will not uh, eat. It affects the ecosystem there. When they keep on catching, they know it's uh, precious, but try to breed these fishes and if they want to sell it, can, no problem. Uh, please try to breed, but not steal it. 
if we continue uh, to catch fishes, it will give a negative effect to the natural ecosystem and it can um, affect the fishes. I hope this does not happen again. This is very important. Conservation can only be successful if there is a, a local community, a good leader, scientists in the university that can help, uh, forestry that can help, um, uh, local officers that can give assistance. If there's nobody that can help, it's uh, tough. So everybody who is involved should provide assistance and it will bring about a successful conservation. I will continue to help as long as I can, including my other friends. One more thing that I would like to say is that I, as a scientist, citizen scientist, they cannot be all over the place at one time. So me, as a citizen scientist, will help you because we can help you to be in places that you cannot be now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abang Ikan. That was such a good presentation um, to share about all the efforts that are going on. Uh, and you said a couple of really important things. I, for one, didn't know how much biodiversity there was specifically in the peat swamp forest. And it's really quite astounding. And also how you and the community saved thousands of fish species. That's so cool. Um, I also really liked how you compared the earth or peat swamps to the earth sponge. And that's also something that we talk about quite often uh, because it's the easiest to understand, right? And why it's so important to conserve it. Because once you cut that sponge, uh, that's when drainage happens and fires um, and then also bringing up you know all the invasive species so i already see that some of our uh, participants have put questions for you in the chat box um, but we'll keep those questions for later during our q a session and i also just wanted to share again um, abang ikan's book fishes of the north selango peat swamp forest so there's a link um, in the chat box there so you can check it out uh, but thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ilham, for sharing your experiences with us. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's the book. It looks like a really cool book. I'd love to read it. Okay, so just give me a moment while I uh, pull up our next speaker slides. Okay. And so next up, we have uh, a true treat we haven't, which we haven't done um, in People for Peat History yet, which is we have a collaborative presentation by two really esteemed researchers, uh, Mr. Alyosia Huye and Mr. Ronald Verneman, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Al and Dr. Ronald, who will be speaking about the subsidence and climate vulnerability of coastal peatlands in Southeast Asia. So Dr. Al, um, joins us from Deltaris, where he's a specialist advisor, and he's also a research professor at the National University of Singapore. And since 1990, which is a pretty long time, about 30 years, 31 years, he has worked in over 30 countries on studies of wetland functioning, flood risk, and carbon emissions. And in Southeast Asia, this has included large-scale assessments in supporting peatland conservation and management with governments plantation industries and NGOs. And this has resulted in a lot of policy papers and scientific publications. And his current focus includes quantifying and communicating the extreme coastal flood risk that is rapidly developing in Southeast Asia caused by unwise land management resulting in subsidence and global sea level rise. Um, and even in Malaysia, that's something we're starting to experience as well. So the true magnitude of this problem and possible solutions can only be understood with better elevation and land use data than, it, than currently used. So he'll be discussing some of his findings today, along with his fellow researcher, who is Dr. Ronald Verneman. Um, and Dr. Ronald joins us as a director, um, an independent researcher uh, in data for sustainability. And for 15 years, he too has been carrying out projects and research on coastal lowlands in Southeast Asia, including tropical peatlands. And his focus has been on mapping those areas using remote sensing techniques um, and includes mapping of deep peat and below ground carbon in East Sumatra, flood risk assessments, 
drained of drained tropical peatlands, and most recently mapping global lowland elevation using satellite LIDAR. So some really, really cool research there. And so his research has been published in peer-reviewed publications and data sets are made available to the public uh, to support sustainable land and management and nature conservation. So this is a first to have both of these really esteemed researchers come um, and share their research with us. So please welcome uh, Dr. Ronald and Dr. Al. Yes, thank you, Mariam. Uh, selamat siang semuanya. Um, I see this is the, the PDF. I don't know if it can be put on, on full screen. Oh, it's not full screen yet, is it? No, it isn't. Thank you for letting me know. So, all right. Ah, okay, thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Um, so, Al, and my colleague, and, and I will be talking you through um, an overview of um, our past research projects in, uh, in Southeast Asia. We'll be talking about uh, subsidence and climate vulnerability of coastal peatlands in Southeast Asia. Um, next slide, please. So, some things we know, um, sea level rise is happening. Um, and the projections of those sea level rise are increasingly alarming. Um, Southeast Asia having the highest coastal subsidence and peatlands in Southeast Asia may mostly flood because their base um, is uh, around mean sea level. So next slide, please. Uh, the topics of our presentation today will be uh, focusing on the global threat of sea level rise as mapped with new satellite LIDAR elevation data. We'll be talking about peatland subsidence in Southeast Asia, um, about flood risk increased due to the combined sea level rise and subsidence, and we will provide and discuss some solution directions. Uh, next slide, please. So in the last couple of years, we have been uh, developing a global lowland uh, LIDAR elevation model from satellite LIDAR, which is very accurate up to uh, half a meter, which is uh, at the moment uh, the best uh, for global uh, elevation models. Um, and what we found using those data is that around half of the global land area and population most vulnerable to sea level rise. And we define that as two meter above mean sea level is in Southeast Asia. And this um, research has recently been published in uh, Nature Communications. This was still using a relatively coarse elevation model. And currently we uh, have improved this to uh, one kilometer uh, resolution. And, but the research is currently uh, in review. Uh, next slide, please. So if we zoom in on Southeast Asia, um, you see here three maps going from left to right, uh, the current uh, situation in 2020. And the middle part is then the elevation um, in Southeast Asia after a relative sea level rise of one meter. So combined sea level rise and subsidence of one meter. And then on the right, you will see the same area, but then with a relative sea level rise of two meters. So with one meter of relative sea level rise, you will have about 140,000 square kilometers, which will be below mean sea level after one meter of sea level rise. And this will increase until almost half a million square kilometers if this reaches two meters. And this may well happen before the year 2100. And accounting for peatland subsidence, this area under threat will be much greater. And especially in those areas which have the most uh, peatlands in Southeast Asia, namely in Sumatra and Borneo. And next slide, please. So this publication has uh, had a lot of uh, media attention, um, as is demonstrated here. 
um, also in the Straight Times, um, on Wired, um, and many uh, more uh, news outlets, um, showing that the focus on uh, Southeast Asia is a real eye-opener uh, for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there is one slide missing. Um, I guess, thank you. Yep. Yeah, this one. Uh, previously, we have also been using airborne LIDAR data where we have mapped uh, the coastal uh, peatlands of uh, East Sumatra, covering uh, three provinces there, South Sumatra, Jambi, and Riau, um, and showing that um, the deep peat areas are actually mostly still forested. Um, and protecting these areas uh, provides an opportunity to not only conserve large amounts of below ground carbon stock, but also the last Sumatra lowland forest and associated high above ground carbon stocks and their unique uh, biodiversity. Um, and we are currently uh, working on using this satellite LIDAR data to map all of the peatlands in, in Southeast Asia, but that is ongoing research, so we cannot show this uh, to you yet. Um, but also based on this research, we found that uh, along these coastal areas, um, their base, so where the peat has been developed on top of the mineral subsoil, is about around a mean sea level. So you can imagine that if you continue the degradation of these peatlands and the subsidence continues, ultimately all of these peatlands, if indeed development continues, will be lost uh, to the sea in time. Um, and with this, I would like to uh, give the floor now to my colleague Al Hoyer, who will be talking more about uh, peatland subsidence and flood risks. Uh, terima kasih. Hello all. Am I visible? Yes, you are, Dr. Al. I don't see myself though. Oh, we can see you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Roland introduced this presentation. A reminder that um, our translators are also trying to keep up. So uh, try and uh, speak a little bit slowly. That'll be really okay. Good. Thank you. I will try. No worries. Um, Ronald has, has opened this presentation mostly with material that is not uh, strictly uh, relevant only to peatlands, because while working on this peatland topic of peatland subsidence and coastal um, flooding, we increasingly found that uh, it is not just peatlands. It's the peatland subsidence flooding problem is part of a much bigger problem that is focused in Southeast Asia. And uh, for this presentation, we thought it would be nice to, to, to present it as such, as part of a bigger problem. Um, the, the sinking deltas and sinking coastlines of Southeast Asia overall, within which the peatlands are sinking most rapidly. Uh, before I speak more about peatlands, just a step back on what are they really? Um, is this coming through well? I don't see any, I, don't, I can't see anything actually now on my screen, so I'm not sure. Yes, Dr. L, we can see. Uh, okay, okay. Visual. Thank you. Um, so most of you will know, but for those who are not fully aware, peat, peatlands are just accumulated vegetation, uh, accumulated over thousands of years. Uh, but in, and in Southeast Asia, this happens in forested conditions. Next, uh, next slide, please. So as long as the water level is close to the surface in this condition, the carbon will be locked up in the soil. Um, and that's why peatlands typically have this, this water uh, self-regulation of keeping the water level close to the surface, just below or just above. Next one, please. For any um, current use that people make of peatlands or most current uses, they drain the peat. So, they take, uh, they, they dig canals and they lower the water table to achieve that. Next one, please. So by exposing this, this uh, uh, vegetation matter that was locked up in the soil underwater, 
uh, and it was locked up because it couldn't oxidize, it couldn't decompose uh, because there was no air. Um, now suddenly this peat is, is dry and exposed to air and it decomposes and it also burns and both just a normal uh, decomposition and fires, they uh, emit the carbon to the atmosphere and they take it from the soil. So the soil surface is going down, as you can see here. Uh, many people are talking about fires as, as, the, as the main concern. In terms of the peat, it actually doesn't matter much if it burns or not, if I'm honest. Um, it will oxidize anyway. Fire is just very rapid oxidation. Um, next one, please. And this process will unfortunately continue until all the peat that is above the water table has been removed to the atmosphere. There is no other outcome possible. As long as you drain peat, this is what's going to happen. Next one, please. And there are many examples of uh, how this is happening. This is a famous photo uh, of a very tall guy standing in a peatland in uh, uh, Johor uh, already in 2007. Uh, this guy is two, two meters and five centimeters tall. Uh, but as you can see from the 1979 indication and the, and the surface in uh, 2007, more than that, actually 2.4 meters was lost in that period. And in those Johor plantations right now, the subsidence has been three and a half meters. And that sounds extreme. But then if you go to, um, to the next, to other areas of the world, next slide, please. So for instance, the Everglades in the USA, Sacramento Delta, also USA, Finland, UK. These are all large famous peatlands that are all being drained. They've all been largely lost or completely lost. Uh, and you can see the amount of peat lost there, elevation lost in time. So these are old studies uh, with many, many observations. So in the Everglades, uh, um, three meters was lost in the first 70 years. Sacramento Delta, five meters in 90 years. Finland, UK, four meters in 150 years. So to lose many meters, to lose many meters of peat after drainage is very common. I mean, I'm from the Netherlands originally. I'm now in Indonesia and we've lost something like 10 meters, but that goes back much further. Next one, please. So uh, an area where we investigated the the outcome of this process some years ago for a project was the Rajang Delta and Sarawak, as shown here in Borneo. Next one, please. So for this area, we created, uh, mostly Ronald created, I have to say, um, an elevation model. Uh, at that point, not from LiDAR, because that wasn't available, but from something that is less accurate, but still quite good, which is airborne radar IFSAR. And we actually bought specifically for this project, bought those data for that area. These are not uh, publicly available. And we created this elevation model. Um, and the upper image shows uh, the uh, elevation in 2009 when that data was collected. Uh, and then we've applied a subsidence rate of three and a half centimeters per year, which is quite common which is what uh, many studies find is uh, a conservative estimate for what happens in plantations in Southeast Asia on peat. Uh, some, we have found five centimeters to be honest, or even higher in some plantations, but others find sometimes three centimeters, two and a half. So three and a half centimeters per year is a conservative average, we think. We've applied that and what you can then see is that in 2009, uh, while in, uh, two th in uh, sorry, 2009, only little land is below two meters above mean sea level. In a century, in 100 years, almost all the land is below two, two meters above mean sea level. Right. Next one, please. Actually, I think we, uh, we skipped a slide here. If I get yeah, this one, I, I think that was skipped. My apologies. Um, so, what you see here is the cause of that subsidence, which is that in um, 2000, the area was largely forested. And uh, in the 90s, I actually worked in the, Sar in the Rajang Delta and Sarawak. Uh, that was my first uh, introduction to tropical forests in general and to tropical peatlands, um, which is one reason why we picked this area, because I, I've known it very well. Uh, and in 2014, as you can see in the lower image here, 
almost all had been uh, cleared for pa a palm, palm oil. So close towards a million hectares. So it's all red, as you can see there. A very little forest left. And now, it's, and now we can go to the next slide, which I already described. Yeah, and then you can see the effect of that um, the, the drainage, the, the conversion of forest to open plantations of the landscape. It goes down, and because it goes down, it floods more. And you can see on the upper image here how much land uh, we find to be uh, flood prone for different reasons, flooding really by river water, but also by drainage problems in, in uh, 2009. And the below picture show predicts how much it will be in 2100 in a century from now. And you can see that almost the entire area is flooded. For the 2009 situation, we had field surveys done in 2014 to check things and uh, our assessment of where flood problems exist does match the field measurements quite well. Uh, even there were more uh, in the field, there were more flood problems uh, reported than we found in our model. Next one, please. So this graph, I won't go into detail here. It shows different pathways. What if we have uh, re reduced drainage a lot? What if we even increase drainage? What if we keep it as now? That's the solid lines. And what you see there, yes, you have different rates on the, on the vertical axis. It says area with flooding problems. And on the horizontal axis, it's, it's years from 2009. And you can see with the different pathways, there's different increases in flooding, uh, the, the amount of flooding that happens in the area. But in the end, it doesn't really matter because eventually, uh, whether the subsidence is fast or slow, it will flood. Uh, that is the meaning of this image. Next one, please. So this doesn't. This is universal. This happens in all peatlands in the world uh, that are drained. It, it, not just in Sarawak or Southeast Asia. This is an example of um, uh, area, uh, a large area in South Sumatra, an area of photo that I took from a helicopter in 2016. And you can see here's a massive drainage canals. This is very large scale. There's about 500 meters between the canals. Um, you can see a lot of infrastructure to drain the land and to uh, have agriculture. But what you don't see is agriculture um, because that is not really working out there. Uh, there's no oil pump plantations. You can see that they're still on the right hand side trying to implement them. But considering that this development started in the 1980s, the clearing, and so they've been uh, working on this for, for several decades already, and um, still no oil pump. So we can see that this area is in big trouble, especially if you consider that the land is still going down slowly. The most of the peat is really gone from this area, and there's pockets left. But even the material below the peak is still subsiding a bit because that's clay. Uh, and of course, the rivers are going up and the sea is going up. So the flooding gets more and more. And next one, please. And this is an example of what people are trying to do to, to make it work. You see an excavator creating more, uh, trying to create the land between the canals. Next one, please. If to the point that yeah, every oil palm in this case uh, has its own little mount, its own little elevation to keep it above the flood levels, which may work for, for some time, maybe some years or even 10. But eventually, of course, with the subsidence and, uh, and the water levels going up, um, those oil palm plantations will not be viable unless people start uh, creating very large dikes and pumping systems like we have in Holland. But that is very costly. Maybe it may be possible, but you would have to uh, be very sure uh, it's feasible economically before you start doing it. Um, next one, please. So what's what's solution direction do we have here? Um, it, it, the threat of peatland drainage to carbon emission and lens of silence is now quite recognized by most Southeast Asian governments, I would say. I mean, people are talking about it. It's, it's, it's not, no longer denied, as it was like 10, 20 years ago by some. Um, there's many guidelines. Governments uh, are even saying, well, this is, this is what you need to do to uh, mitigate it. People are not talking about avoiding the problem, but about mitigating it, uh, reducing it. Um, but 
that still means it's, it, uh, the flooding is going to happen, right? Apart from the carbon emission. So what are the possible uh, directions? So if you go to the numbers, we can have business, business as usual. Uh, so we can just keep doing what happens now, which is also keep growing crops, often suboptimal because of the flooding problems. Uh, the yields may not be so high uh, and they will certainly decline as sea level rises and investments are uh, will also uh, be, be less and less because uh, investors don't like to throw money into conditions that are not improving, right? Um, the, the second one is gradual unplanned abandonment. Uh, once land, land is abandoned, abandoned because there's too much flooding, vegetation returns, but no real forest ecosystem. So what you get is a wasteland with no real ownership and high fire risk. We see this in large areas throughout the region. Uh, that's very common. Um, polarization is the third option. Uh, dikes and pumping, as I just mentioned, um, to control the floods. If this is possible uh, if, you, if you have the, the high technical capacity to do it. It's very large scale. Uh, it's very expensive. It's very complex. Uh, it, it may not succeed at large scale. Um, certainly, you would need very thorough cost-benefit assessments before you go into bank on it. If you consider that the area where this would be needed is uh, to altogether for us in Southeast Asia, more than 10 times the area that is polarized in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands uh, estimates vary, but uh, the, the annual cost of, of keeping that system intact is at least 40 billion euros a year. Um, so if, if you would have that, the Dutch system in Southeast Asia, that would be 400 billion euros a year. That is bigger than most economies in the area. So uh, that would be extremely expensive. Um, but it may be possible. We're not saying it's not possible. Um, the, the fourth option is planned zoning and optimization. So some areas can be polarized where it's more hopeful. Uh, others can be planted with crops that are uh, flood tolerant. Uh, uh, but we say uh, others need to be protected so nature can return. Um, in some areas, you want to uh, limit urbanization and infrastructure. Uh, and, and to have them only in certain areas where it's, that are more suitable. So what we see now in our assessment is that we have business as usual. It's beginning to change to two, uh, gradual abandonment. Uh, three is, is being talked about, um, but there's no real large scale trials of how that would work. Uh, it, again, it may be possible. We're not saying it's not possible, um, but if it, if if countries want to try it, it's better to start testing it soon, I think. Um, for, according to international organizations, the, uh, they often say that's the most sensible scenario. So that's uh, planned zoning and optimization, a lot of conservation, but some uh, production, uh, but not no one size fits all solution. Um, but that needs a lot of long-term uh, and large scale planning, very careful planning and a lot of data. Uh, and you need to defend, uh, develop alternative markets for new crops that are flood tolerant. Uh, and you need to uh, have quite forceful implementation because the local stakeholders may not all want, want the same thing. Uh, some want to wait for another 20 years. Others are very eager to change now. Some will never want to change. So this can only work if large landscapes are managed in, in certain ways. And that takes uh, a, a powerful uh, government, basically. Um, and it also takes public-private champions. It takes companies to uh, to go there. Next one, please. So for that, what we think is the optimum solution of, of, of very careful planning and see what's possible where, uh, you will need very detailed land elevation models. And these have been lacking so far uh, in the region. Uh, there's technical reasons for that. I won't go into that. Um, but uh, it, it, in Europe and America, people are using national uh, elevation data based on national uh, LIDAR collection, which is extremely expensive, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars involved in that. In uh, Southeast Asia, that's not happening so much. Uh, but now we have satellite data that can do almost the same. Um, and that will reveal, uh, that are revealing the real condition. And we propose that such data are now being used for uh, a realistic and accurate assessment. Um, and that will also be very cost effective. Next one, please. Yeah, some, some uh, pragmatic illustrations of that we could find of 
um, sub solutions. If you have these accurate elevation data, you can um, be much more precise on how you block canals and how you uh, uh, rewet areas where that is and, and, and restore nature where that is the aim. So this is a case of uh, an example in Brunei along a road uh, that was cleared by shell for uh, for pipelines. You can see the pipeline there, water pipeline. Uh, you can see on the on the left hand, you can see the vertical profile that we generated from LiDAR there. Um, you can see the, the excavators having very precise uh, methods and locations to, to close that canal with peat and sand. And by doing that, uh, and the water steps of each dam would be exactly 20 centimeters. And by doing it that way, next one please, um, we did achieve, uh, this was a project with Wetlands International, by the way, um, it, it was achieved that the, the, the canal became very wet, and the vegetation started invading it, which blocked it further. And uh, as you can see in the lower images, the canal is not even visible uh, anymore after a few years. So that area has really been blocked very effectively by, uh, by adding lots of dams, uh, using good information, good data. Next one, please. So this is a similar case, but much larger scale in uh, in Sumatra, and, and we've also done this in, uh, in Kalimantan, in Indonesia. Uh, so for a company uh, that manages millions of, uh, well, more than a million hectares of, of peatland, uh, and that wanted to uh, to raise water levels all over. Uh, often it's bordered on uh, adjoining forest and it wanted to conserve the forest as well. So we helped that company to uh, block the canals in many locations. I think a total of more than 4,000 blocks like this were built um, in some months. So there was a very big operation with more than uh, 100 excavators. Um, and uh, you can't see that here, but that, uh, that has really resulted in, in much wetter conditions in many of these landscapes. Next one, please. That's actually the last one. So this is an, an image I shot once, in, in, I think in Aceh, of uh, an old established palm oil plantation that is now very much flooded on peat, very much flooded because of subsidence. And uh, we are trying to help how to avoid this happening in many more, many more areas. Okay, that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Al. Um, that was quite the presentation i mean you know the fact that you know things are going in that that kind of alarming rate has taken me aback quite a bit um but at least you're providing some potential solutions on how we can address these issues um so i think already we've got a lot of questions for you both in our chat box so allow me to move to our next section um just give me a moment while i while i change the slides uh which is to our Q&A. Okay, so we've just heard from both Dr. Al as well as Dr. Ronald. Thank you both so much. And oh, let me launch one more poll before we get into um, our, before we get into our Q&A. So this is our last poll of the day. Um, what do you think, who do you think um, is most responsible for mitigating flood risk on peatlands? So I'll just give you guys a moment to uh, answer that poll. Okay. All right, I'm going to probably end the poll here. Yeah, We've gotten about 50% answers. So let's end the poll and I will share the results. So it's a mix. 70% um, of you said government agencies, 25% uh, said landowners and unions of small uh, farmers and smallholders, uh, and then 4% uh, research institutes, and then 2% financial institutes. That's quite interesting. That even is an interesting point of discussion that way maybe we can uh, address shortly. So uh, yeah, so now let's go to our Q&A session. 
So if I could invite our speakers back um, to uh, back to the screen and go with our first question. So we've got quite a few. Um, I'll just kind of go in between uh, speakers. So one of our first questions earlier on during um, Mr. Ilham's presentation was specifically, uh, is Beta Livida, which is Ikan Laga Merah Langat, only endemic to North Selangor peat swamp forest? So um, Mr. Ilham, would you like to address that? Uh, beta Livida dia ada dekat Beta Livida is at uh, at uh, Selangor Selatan Perak and uh, and also south of Perak uh, so dia boleh dikatakan and it can be said that it is endemic to uh, southern Perak and uh, Selangor and and in the book that I published at uh, that is this uh, there's a habitat that is being mentioned in Selangor and that is the biggest habitat and this is uh, being protected in Malaysia. That is around 30,000 hectare of this pig land and uh, lately uh, it has, part of this has been uh, developed, I don't know why, but I feel that the impact must be very great because each year this place will be flooded. If this is uh, being developed, there will be a problem arise. Thank you. Uh, it, in terms of, of the forestry department. You have the weather the same much, right? Weather only totally different the terrain, the soil plus so degree plus, and also the soil type. Uh, okay, so the next question, uh, this is directed to both Dr. L as well as Mr. Ron, uh, Dr. Ronald. So based on long-term data, is there any correlation between El Nino or La Nina events with peat subsidence, especially in Southeast Asian countries. Dr. Al Orono, whoever uh, would like to address this question. Oh, yeah, maybe if it's about peat, it's, it's uh, fast as yeah. you can do it. Um, the, the, not so much directly with El Nino, uh, La Nina, which are very wet, very dry and very wet years, as, as you know. Um, but there's been a very strong correlation between peat subsidence and water depth. Uh, what a table depth in the peat, and of course uh, these these events they cor they cor they translate into rainfall differences. The rainfall differences translate into uh, different water depths, and those uh, will translate into uh, subsidence for sure. Yeah. yeah. So the answer is yes. It does. It does ultimately affect. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, there's of course a relation there, but it's mostly uh, a robust natural system. Peatland system can deal with that. It will have years that are dry when there's no peat accumulating. There may even be some loss, but the forest is still there. And then if the next year is wet, it will make up for that uh, pullback in peat accumulation. And you can see that in the records, there's variations there in how fast the accumulation uh, is. Um, but as soon as you drain it and that natural vegetation is gone, that uh, resilience is gone. So it's, it's, it's losing peat every year. Subsidence is happening every year, but it's happening even more in dry years like El Nino. Yeah. So you're saying in an, in, if the peat wasn't disturbed, uh, while there will be flooding and drying, but it's because peat naturally is regulating those issues, it wouldn't have been an issue, right? But because of the peat drainage that's been happening, that's where we're seeing these effects. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Al. Okay, so um, this, actually this question I think came from um, Abang Ikan himself, uh, Mr. Ilha, um, and this is addressed to, uh, I guess, both of both of you. So actually, Mr. Ilha, would you like to share your question in person since you're a speaker as well? It was about uh, the Peros Ferrum Menace Tweedy in Pontian Johor. Yeah, we have a problem uh, the, because this species, because this species are now living at the uh, kennel uh, in plantation. So dia sekarang hidup hanya dah tak ada hutan, dah habitat dia semua dah. Because there's no forest and everything has been extinct and uh, it only has uh, in in this uh, pit swamp in the 
plantation, but unfortunately, every year when it's flood season, the the government will 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 just uh, excavate and then uh, this pig swamp and uh, eventually will be on top when the pig swamp is on top and the water is le getting lesser at the peatland in and, be and it's become just normal uh, it's just a, a press water swamp not the pig swamp and uh, as time go by and uh, things will get destroyed and how can we prevent this from happening because too many uh, species of a uh, hy hyper endemic species living in the uh, in the plantation they they live in the plantation but in plantation is being developed with two uh, high rates and uh, when and eventually the swamp is going to be lost and how can we uh, actually prevent this from happen um, um, professor oh sorry dr l did you get that oh sorry on mute doctor no, I missed part of the question. Can, can the, the question be summarized? Yeah, so the summary of it is that um, there's a lot of species that are likely going to go extinct because they live in peatlands. However, because of uh, development, a lot of these peatlands are being turned into plantations. For example, pineapple plantations, uh, which is definitely ideal for the preservation of biodiversity. So is there anything that can be done about this? And also uh, there's the issue of people digging through peat, right? And making it, and I guess taking it out uh, and making the water no longer like a peat swamp forest, it just becomes a swamp forest. Uh, so do you have any comments about that? Yeah, for the, so the, for, the, for the situation, of course, where I'm not an ecologist, so I'm not uh, perfectly placed to answer this, to be honest, but I'm sure that uh, the, the, fish, the fish brother will agree that, um, if you remove the forest, the fish is, is doomed. Um, you know, that cannot survive in canals if it's used to, to live in small puddles in the forest. Uh, the, the typical forest hydrology is small hummocks and hollows, lots of little puddles, and the fish, they sort of swim in between those. Some are large, it's like small lakes or ponds. Some are really tiny. Um, so yeah, once you, once you take the forest out, that's the end. Um, in the case, I'm sure uh, when the forest is still there, but it's drier because of drainage in the distance, um, I think it, it depends, I guess, on how, how much it is drained. If there's still some puddles, some fish may still survive. I, I know from uh, some limited self uh, observation and certainly from people telling me things that some, some of these fish, they actually survive in the peat itself in dry periods. Maybe the peat brother can uh, uh, explain that, but I think it's it's basically once you start draining, it's the end of that peat and it's the end of the fish. To be honest, yeah, yeah that's a sad truth. Hey, eh? uh, any comments, yeah. Mr. Ilham? Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, there's an interesting question here from Rafik of Spiral Blue Australia, and the question is directed to Mr. Ilham, but I'm kind of curious how um, both Ronald and uh, Dr. Ronald and Dr. Al might answer this in a way as well, which is Muhammad Ilham, uh, great work indeed. Do you have any in situ conservation regulations on private properties? And have you ever tried to educate and motivate property owners? Uh, I have read and, uh, and released at this plantation area and there are places whereby the uh, landowner, if they are, I have tried, I have tried to let the owner know that this place, uh, there are special fishes and um, many of them ignore and uh, there are a few, a few owners, they, they concern. So they make a drainage that is quite good. Uh, they uh, build a dam so that the water was is not too dry up and the water is still at the drainage. And when we uh, release the uh, fishes, uh, a, a, 
uh, different species of fishes and um, they can actually uh, live well in those places because they build a system hydro a hydrology system that is quite good and uh, sometimes there are a few species of uh, of the peatland uh, that can live in the uh, plantation area if we, they apply the technique that are good. That's really interesting. Uh, so you're saying that there that, have been like positive uh, outcomes of working together with private landowners to ensure that uh, there is some conservation, in situ conservation happening. Yeah, ada sebagian, yeah. Sebab, uh, yes, some of them if if they start to uh, dig into the land and the water dry up and, and and if they build the dam for the hydrology and the water in the plantation will be will be stable and the fish will be able to live on and uh, the water near the, the the boundary of the forest is good because when they dig the the uh, water will be drained out when it's drained out and then uh, the if it is strained up the fish is gone and if they build with a, a good way so it's a win-win situation and uh, because they need to find a living so if you do in a win-win situation if uh, they build with a good system and the fish can live and the plantation also can be developed in a better way and so that's also something um mr l or dr l brought up in his presentation as well which is you know uh the the collaboration between private property owners um, and and businesses to work in making sure that subsidence doesn't happen. So do you have any comments on that, Dr. L or um, Dr. Ronald as well? We've had uh, very positive uh, experiences with working with some companies on, uh, on peatland conservation within their concessions. Um, over the years, it's our, yes, comp some companies are interested in that. Uh, and the, the benefit, of course, of working with them is that they have a strong mandate in that area. Um, on the other hand, what they cannot do is, uh, what, what I find harder, is work with many other stakeholders in the same, same landscape. Uh, so, uh, and water management is often about uh, managing a whole peat dome or a larger part of it, and, and there will be more uh, often more stakeholders there. And, and that is a job that needs to be done by government. Uh, and that's often where the problems are in that in that interaction, if you know what I mean. Understood that when yeah. the more people you have to, you know, manage, of course, the more difficult it is. And then everyone has their own interests as well. So totally understand that. But that's good to hear that you have had positive uh, interactions and positive outcomes from working with property owners. That's very encouraging. Uh, Dr. Ronald, is there any comments from you about, about this issue? No, no, not in this matter. I mean, I, of course, I fully agree with Al. So, yeah. awesome. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to our next question. Uh, and this comes from Rabil Yarhan Mahardika of IPB University. Uh, and this is directed to Professor Al and Professor uh, Ronald. And the question is, is the peat reworking process currently being carried out in Indonesia effective in reducing the rate of peat subsidence? As we know that even in shallow groundwater conditions, oxidative conditions still occur in peat. Um, this is less than, more than 300 to 200 MV. Thank you. Um. Yeah, there's a, quite a bit of discussion behind that question. I think it mm -hmm. relates to a question that we see below. Uh, somebody asks um, uh, how, how fast it can be uh, re uh, restored after rewetting. Um, so I think these two questions relate yeah. by uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Rabiri Yaram and uh, Mr. Abdiri Satya. Um, the, the one, one answer, uh, one easy answer would be we, we don't, don't quite know and um, the projects are, studies are ongoing to find it out, including uh, one study that Roland and I are doing with uh, Singapore University in Sumatra. So there are studies into, into uh, new uh, regional silence and uh, 
extended no because it uh, regenerate. Um, but that is a bit of an easy answer. I think the more complicated answer, and not always popular, is that we know that peanuts are very complex ecosystems, and it's not just about peat and plants. It's about micro uh, topography. It's about microorganisms. Uh, there's thousands of actors there, and before and and draining and clearing and draining a peatland is uh, basically killing that ecosystem completely. There's nothing left to work with. So you need to bring a deck from scratch. And that takes a lot of time. And you, you, you think in years for a peatland restoration is not really realistic. Mm -hmm. You have to think in decades and, and probably for, and this depends on how perfect you want it to be, uh, centuries. But certainly decades is, is uh, before you can see something that resembles a real peat swamp forest. Uh, probably still with far fewer species, uh, still oxidation going on. Um, so to the first question, uh, is it effectively stopped the, the loss of peat? Not for decades. Mm. Uh, does it help to rewet it? Yes. And the other question would be, what else can you do? If you, if you, can't, if you don't rewet it, you're certainly going to lose it. Um, so there's no other alternative than to manage it better. Uh, unless you just accept, which is, which is a policy choice that can be made. We're going to lose this peat. We're just going to get as much production of it before we lose it completely, and then we lose the land as well. Um, but that's that's a drastic uh, decision that also needs to be um, clarified. If you know what I mean, it's 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 uh, it should not happen by stealth. That's that's what I mean. It should be it should be a choice. Are we going to lose this land or are we not going to lose this land? Right. That's that's a really key way of putting it. You know, we, people have to make the decision uh, rather than just status quo and then try and reverse it later on, right? That's a little too little, too late, is what you're saying. A little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. So there's a couple other questions related to rewetting. So I'll leave that uh, since you you just kind of answered that as a whole, um, and then that moves us to one of our last questions, I think. Uh, which is by RD to everyone, which is peatland areas in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, are located in lowland and coastal areas that are also integrated with mangrove ecosystems or mangrove swamps and play a vital role as irreversible carbon. So how to mitigate decomposition emission from this connected landscape? And I mean, this is related to your earlier answer, I think as well, but I'll let you address that. All right. Um, well, it, it's very true that originally uh, you would have integrated mangrove peatland ecosystems uh, throughout Southeast Asia and actually throughout the tropics, also in Africa and uh, South America, but mostly in Southeast Asia. Uh, unfortunately, it's also true, and it wouldn't be just mangrove and, and uh, peatlands, it would also be freshwater swamps, which is basically fr uh, uh, freshwater, unlike a mangrove, but it's not peaty, unlike a peat swamp. Uh, so the, no, the usual order is to have lagoons, mangroves, freshwater swamps, and peatlands. And, and then you get into the hills and the mountains, the, the, the dry land. Um, there's very few places left in Southeast Asia where you still have that sequence left. Um, I'm not aware of any in, uh, in Malaysia. I, I know one or two places in uh, um, Sumatra where they still left, the Kluwet area in, in um, Aceh and uh, Sembilang National Park, Sembilang Burbeck in uh, South Sumatra, Jambi. They still have this sequence more or less intact. Papua still has it. I'm not sure about other locations. Um, so that's one, one part of that answer. And the other part is, um, is there a link in, in how to manage the carbon in these landscapes? I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. Uh, it's, it's, Biodiversity, yes, that, that should be, it's important if you have mangroves and peatlands next to each other to manage it as one landscape and that will benefit the overall biodiversity uh, because things can migrate between the two. Um, if, um, if they're separated, is it still important to link mangrove management to peatland management? I'm not sure. It may just complicate things, uh, to, to be honest. I'm, I'm not so sure. It, 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 I, yeah, I have no answer there. That's right. All right. Thank you, Dr.
So we just got another question come in from Rahma Alia uh, Zahra. Uh, and this is about LIDAR. So based on your previous analysis, Mr. Huyer, how good is the correlation of LIDAR data based on statistical analysis compared to field elevation data to monitor the peat subsidence? Could it be accessed as mitig to mitigate as an early warning system? Because this data really matters, especially in vast wetlands in Indonesia. Or maybe, um, is there something Ronald would like to answer? Yes, I would be happy to give this one to Ronald. Uh, <laughs> that I, that's all there to that, yeah. Awesome. Yes, yes, I can, I can answer that. Well, um, you need to understand that as with all measurements, uh, there is a, a certain amount of uh, uncertainty. And also with, um, I'm talking now about airborne LIDAR, there is an uncertainty of about 10 centimeters. Uh, so you would have to have at least a couple of years in between your uh, airborne LIDAR observations before you can actually accurately uh, monitor subsidence using this method. And of course, field measurements using uh, uh, subsidence poles in the field are much more accurate, but of course also much more labor intensive. Um, and to make matters, um, it's also important to uh, when you use subsidence poles that you actually install them in the mineral soil. Um, so underneath the substrate of, uh, of the peatlands. Uh, we, we often find uh, that we get subsidence records, but then when we find out that the subsidence poles have actually only been inserted in the, in the peat for one to two meters, and then using seasonal variations, you see um, it going up and down, so you're actually not measuring subsidence. So in short, yes, you could use uh, airborne LIDAR, uh, and to a much lesser extent, uh, satellite LIDAR to, to monitor subsidence in, in peatlands, but you will need to do that over a, an extensive period of time. I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, we have one more question coming in from Joe uh, of TRCRC, and this uh, is addressed to both Dr. L and Dr. Ronald. Uh, considering the forecasted flooding within the century in Southeast Asian peatlands, how should areas be prioritized for rewetting and conservation? Because critics would argue to carry on with business as usual since they would be wet again when it floods anyway. Uh, Ronald, would you like to address that first? Well, um, well, prioritization, I would say, would be those areas which are ordered uh, next to still intact peat swamp forest. And uh, that will be my, 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 my first goal, to focus on those areas um, and to create buffer zones um, towards these uh, peat swamp forests so that at least you can prevent further degradation uh, for those areas. Great, that's a, that's a good point. Um, any comments from you, Dr. L? Oh, you're on mute, Dr. L, sorry. You're on mute, sorry, Dr. L. Yeah, apologies. Mm -hmm. um, just to add to uh, Ronald's point, so uh, uh, Mr. Joe's uh, last line, critics would argue to carry on with business as usual since they would be wet again when it was lots anyway. This goes back to what I said earlier. I think it, governments can make a decision to just lose land, right? Um, it's, it's, it, it could be a rational decision. Uh, I, I would advise them to have a, a backup plan uh, from where to get the future uh, production and, and other uh, functions to get from the land. But it, that could be a decision. Um, I, would, I would warn against by saying, well, it's, it, peatland should be wet anyway. So what, what is wrong with uh, letting them subside and then flood? Um, a peatland wetness is very delicate. Uh, balanced uh, system that has been evolving over thousands of years. As I said, it's, it's little hummocks and hollows. Uh, it has allowed uh, thousands of species to evolve only there, as we just heard from the fish uh, expert. Um, and th there's value there. That is a very intrinsic value that 
can maybe cannot be monetized so easily, but in my, I'm a, I'm a nature lover. I think that has value by its own, uh, regardless of how much money you make off the land. But that is for everybody to decide. Um, the flooding that you get after you subsided it and uh, it goes down is just a blanket flooding by river water. There's nothing um, uh, by in ecologically interesting going on then. It just becomes part of the river floodplain. It could be a very bad part of the river floodplain because it still has a high organic content and many things don't grow properly on that when, when flooded. Um, uh, in the worst case, and that is actually linked going back to the sea level rise point, it's not even the worst case, it's the likely scenario. In the longer term, it will be turned salty. It will become not just uh, wet, it will become saline, and you have effectively lost the land. You have changed the coastline. And that is really, it's not a doom scenario, it's a very realistic scenario of what's going to happen in large parts of Southeast Asia. And again, just look at the map of Europe and Netherlands, but also England, the Finland, many areas have been lost and reclaimed over the centuries, precisely because of this process, right? Draining the peat, draining the lands, lowering them, they get flooded, they're lost to the sea. And then uh, in many countries, but mostly in Holland, they have reclaimed it. So it's land again, but below sea level. Um, so that is the, the future for, for uh, coastlines along, for instance, Suma, uh, Sumatra and, and uh, parts of Sarawak. Uh, uh, the, the coastline will recede by tens or hundreds of kilometers. Um, so that it's not just about flooding, it's really about land loss. That's basically the future. Yeah, that's a key distinction. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Al. So I don't think we have any more questions, but that leads me to my last question for uh, all three of you, which is we've talked about a lot of, especially in terms of, you know, land subsidence and, and like not worst case scenarios, but realistic scenarios. Uh, what then gives you hope for the future in terms of um, our peatlands in Southeast Asia? Uh, I'll give it to you, uh, Dr. L, and then we'll go uh, down from there. Well, actually we saw the slide giving some hope. Um, I think it was slide number seven, uh, where Ronald showed the map and the profile uh, along Sumatra coast some years ago, but I think it hasn't changed very much since then, where we do show that although a lot of peatland forest has been lost uh, and a lot of peatland has been drained, the deepest peatlands, uh, which, which has the greatest carbon resources, but also a lot of forest, still exist. Um, if you protect those areas, which is maybe only 20, 25% of the original peatland extent, you have uh, salvaged more than 50%, maybe 75% of the remaining carbon, and you salvage those peatland ecosystems. And for instance, we see that happening, uh, not without some issues, but it is happening, for instance, on the Carb Kampar Peninsula in Sumatra, which is a huge, maybe the biggest peat dome. Uh, certainly in Southeast Asia, maybe in the world, it's a huge area, 700,000 hectares, feet more than 10 meters deep, still uh, for two thirds forested, um, and still uh, hopeful. So it is possible. That's great. Thank you for sharing that and for reminding us that you know there is there are um, positive things that you can continue to do uh, to effect change um, and to stop this from happening. Um, Ronald, over to you. Yes, I, I second that, of course. Um, and on, on top of that, I mean, we know so much of those peatlands, of their functioning. I mean, we all know what needs to happen, right? You need to stay out of them. Uh, create at least a buffer zone between the existing uh, forested uh, areas. Don't open or allow to open uh, peat swamp forest for, for development because yeah, unless the government really wants to, of course, uh, and, and they will have their reasons. But uh, we all know what can be done to, to stop it, or at least not to, to further make it, uh, make it worse. So there is hope. I mean, we see that the degradation is halting, at least in, in, in certain areas. So uh, let's hope it stays that way. Um, or otherwise, we, yeah, we all know what, what is going to happen. And, and ultimately, that's then a choice, of course, of uh, the respective governments. Uh, we can only 
provide the science and provide the data um, so that good management decisions uh, can be made. Absolutely. Thank you for summarizing that, Dr. Rano. All right, over to you, uh, Mr. Ilham. What gives you hope for the future of peatlands? And you're on mute, uh, Mr. Ilham. Okay. Uh... I don't know other places, but I think the uh, situation is almost the same. But many times we focus on uh, for improvement uh, for improvement in this peatland area, but uh, we forget that this uh, peatland that has to be uh, has to be maintained if we if we are busy. Uh, busy with conservation and it involves cost and if the cost is okay we still need to take care of it so that uh, we don't let it uh, develop again because conservation of peatland uh, it involves high cost and and we have to plant it we have to take care of it it is unlike other forests because peatland is very difficult to be conserved so what if we focus on on the existing existing one and do not develop again if we want to develop and want to conserve it's very difficult because uh, when we do the conservation it do it involve a lot of uh, efforts and let us take care of all this peatland in the asia in southeast asia and uh, do not develop anymore if it is developed and uh, it will the floods and the fi forest fire will happen when the fire happen that it will bring us this uh, problem like death and all kinds of problems. And uh, those times in olden days is different. We can we can talk it out and we can have this uh, uh, published in the newspaper, but now we have all different social medias. Not only me, not only me, that we, uh, all of us that we can work together then uh, let everyone and also government and anyone the importance of the peatland. Without peatland, we will surely have problems. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, for your time today for answering all these questions uh, and giving your best response and giving us hope for the future as, especially um, and thank you to all of our presenters uh, uh, sorry our participants for all of your great questions so now on to uh, just a couple housekeeping things as we wrap up today's session uh, i hope you enjoyed that session as much as i did i learned so much uh, and it was a great discussion as well so if you had fun today and you learned something new, do join us for our upcoming symposium series. So we're concluding today uh, on what peat water management and our next symposium will be a special edition on livelihoods on peat, which will be really exciting. Uh, that will give us more uh, options about what alternatives can be done on peatlands to make sure that they stay wet, um, but at the same time still prioritize livelihoods on them. So that will be happening in May. Uh, and then our third symposium will be technology on peat, which will be very exciting as well, uh, followed by the role of youth in peatland awareness and haze mitigation in July. And then on uh, in August, we have symposium five, which will be culture and sustenance. And a new part of our symposium series this year is that we're also doing more small scale workshops. So those uh, are more limited in seating. So do sign up for those uh, as soon as you see the, uh, the option to do so. So the first work workshop will be about uh, livelihoods on feet, and this will be a practical workshop as will the second workshop, which is gonna be about the role of youth and awareness in haze mitigation. And these will be in June and July respectively. So looking forward to seeing you guys then. Uh, I have something exciting to announce. Uh, we are really, really pleased to announce uh, the, P the PFP ASEAN Peatland Photo Contest. We're running it for the second time. Uh, we ran it last year to uh, a lot of different entries. And so this is our official announcement. It's officially open uh, and there will be five prizes to be won. Uh, there's a, obviously these are all the grand prizes. There are three categ or four categories. Uh, so you can see the link in the chat box uh, my colleagues will be sharing shortly uh, and it will be running from now up until the 6th of June. So do, uh, if you have some photos on Pete, if you live on Pete, if you work on Pete, uh, do join this contest. It's a really fun contest to join. And this year we also have a different category. So we've got um, mobile photography. So that makes it more accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. 
Uh, we've got DSLR photography as a category. So if you have a more professional level camera, and then we also have a visual storytelling category. So if you're really good with words as well as photography, you can join that one. So all really exciting stuff. Uh, we look forward to seeing your entry. So please do uh, join us. Uh, and the links are up in the chat box now. So if you'd like to take a look at that, please do. And then we also have, of course, every, uh, it's become a, P, a PFP tradition now that we have our post-event survey in which if you fill it up, you will receive an e-certificate for your participation today. So please do fill that up. We always love to hear your feedback, uh, whether, you know, what you learned, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like even, um, and we will give you an e-certificate of participation. So thank you so much. And then... Uh, yeah, lastly, you know, I really hope that you guys learned a lot today. Uh, it's always such a joy to bring in speakers from all over the world to share, you know, their perspectives, their experience. And I'm always learning uh, from these events and I hope you are too. So thank you so much for your time and your energy today. We really, really appreciate it. And do follow us on social media. Uh, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, as well as YouTube. And not to worry, of course, every, after every symposium, we do send out an email uh, with all of the recordings as well as all the presentation materials. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be sending it within the week or so. So uh, yeah, that's all for today, I think. Again, thank you to our sponsors, which is the European Union. Um, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you to our speakers as well. <laughs>